Good evening. The planet Saturn is now nicely on view in the evening sky, below the square of Pegasus, looking like a bright star. The rings are edgewise on, and this is a sketch I made the other evening with my 15-inch reflector. You can see the rings there as a thin line of light. I was also able to see eight of Saturn's moons, although of these, only one, Titan, is big. But what about the outermost members of the planetary family, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto? Saturn was the outermost planet known in ancient times. And then along came William Herschel, a young Hanoverian musician who came to England and became organist at the Octagon Chapel in the city of Bath. He set up house at number 19 New King Street, Bath, now I may say a Herschel Museum, and there in the 1770s he made telescopes, very often in the cellar of number 19. And the telescopes he made were about the best of their time. And with one of these, in 1781, he made his greatest discovery. He was charting stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins, when he found something which quite clearly was not a star. First of all, it showed a disk, which no star can do. And secondly, it moved against the starry background from night to night. So clearly, it had to be close. It had to be a member of the solar system. Herschel believed it to be a comet. But when the path was worked out, it was found to be a new planet, much further away than Saturn, the planet we now call Uranus. You can actually see Uranus with the naked eye if you know just where to look for it. At the moment, it's in the constellation of Sagittarius, the archer. But frankly, I think you'll need a star map because with the naked eye, it looks like a very dim star and it also appears stellar in binoculars. Telescopically, of course, it doesn't. Uh, it shows a disk. And that's the sketch I made with the Palomar 60-inch reflector. Uh, you can't see much detail there. Uranus is a very bland kind of world. So what exactly is it? Well, to start with, it's a long way away, more than 1,700 million miles from the sun. It takes 84 years to go round, and its own day is short, less than 20 hours long. And it is big, diameter 30,000 miles or so, much bigger than the Earth, as you can see. But on the other hand, it's not the same kind of world as the Earth, it's a gas giant. The outer surface, the surface you can see, is made up of gas, largely hydrogen, and inside there are largely ices and a good deal of liquid there too. So Uranus and the Earth are very different. But there's another strange point too. The most curious thing, I think, about Uranus is the tilt of its axis of rotation. Our axis is tilted to the perpendicular by 23 and a half degrees, and that's why we have our seasons. In the case of Uranus, the tilt is 98 degrees, more than a right angle. And so the seasons there are very strange indeed. First one pole, and then another, has a midnight sun lasting for 21 Earth years, with a corresponding period of darkness at the opposite pole. And just why Uranus is tipped in that way, frankly, we don't know. I think the popular theory is that in its early stages, it was literally hit by a massive body and thrown on its side. I find that rather hard to believe with a gas giant 30,000 miles across, but um, I can't think of anything better, and it's best to say that we simply do not know. In 1977, it was found that Uranus has a system of rings. As it travels across the sky against the stars, there are times when Uranus passes in front of a star and hides or occults it. This happened in 1977, and the occultation was observed by astronomers on various sites including those in the Kuiper Airborne Observatory, which, you may remember, we visited some time ago. But the funny thing was this. Both before and after the actual occultation, the star winked systematically, and therefore, clearly, it was being covered up by rings associated with Uranus. And those rings have now been amply confirmed, but they are dark, and they are not in the least like the bright, icy rings of Saturn. It was in 1986 that we had our first really good close-up views of Uranus, and they were sent back by the probe Voyager 2. Now remember, there were two Voyagers. Voyager 1 surveyed Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 2 was much more ambitious. By sheer luck, and it was sheer luck, at the end of the 1970s, the four giant planets were spread out in a kind of long curve, and therefore, using what they call gravity assist, it became possible to send the same probe from one to another, and Voyager 2 surveyed all four in turn. It was launched in 1977, and it bypassed Jupiter in 1979. Used Jupiter's pull to send it on to a rendezvous with Saturn in 1981. Saturn then sent it on to Uranus, 1986. 
And finally, out beyond Neptune in 1989, after which Voyager 2 began a never-ending journey out of the solar system. It'll never come back. We are still in touch with it, but um, of course eventually we'll lose it, and we'll never know what finally happened to it. But it did a magnificent job and sent back good pictures of all the four major planets. Uranus, in many respects, is the odd one out. First of all, the strange axial tilt means that when you see it, the pole is in the middle of the disk and the equator is all round. And there are no major markings there, only a few rather vague clouds. And then there's the question of the magnetic field, which Voyager told us about. We have a magnetic field, so is Uranus. But the magnetic axis is tilted very sharply to the axis of rotation, as you can see there. They are quite different. Also, the magnetic field is the reverse of ours. And again, we don't know why that is so. And yet another point. Jupiter, Saturn and Neptune all have very considerable sources of inner heat. Uranus has not. And therefore, Uranus and Neptune have about the same temperature, even though Uranus is so much closer to the Sun. And again, we don't know where that is. Uranus does have a family of satellites, and they were surveyed by Voyager. But even the largest of them, Titania, is smaller than our moon, quite considerably smaller. But they're all icy, and they're all cratered. Oberon, the outer one, there's a Voyager picture of it, an icy crater surface. Titania, with its ice cliffs. Umbriel, much more subdued. That curious thing near the top there, Wunder, we're not sure what that is. It could be a crater wall. Ariel, the strange branching valleys. And finally, the smallest one, Miranda, which is a geologist paradise with strange trapezoidal features, craters, mountains, and ice cliffs. Uh, we don't know quite why Miranda was like that. Look at those ice cliffs. And also, Voyager did discover several more new inner satellites that you can't see from Earth. They are too close to Uranus. And finally, as we say a farewell, there's the last Voyager shot showing Uranus as a crescent as Voyager goes on on its way to Neptune. Now, Uranus was discovered in 1781. The first thing that happens when a new planet is found is that the mathematicians get together and work out the orbit and decide how the planet moves. Well, Uranus refused to behave. It persistently wandered away from its predicted path. So something was pulling it out of position. And the mathematicians decided, quite rightly, that this something must be a new planet moving further out than Uranus and perturbing it. The first man in the field was John Couch Adams of Cambridge. In 1840, he began work and decided he could find out where the new planet was. He got a position. He sent the results to the Astronomer Royal, Sir George Airy, who took no immediate action. Meanwhile, unknown to Adams in France, Urbain de Verrier was working on the same program. Uh, he also sent his results into Paris, got nowhere, and then sent his results to the Berlin Observatory to Johann Galler. And Galler, together with his colleague Darest, they used this telescope to look in the position indicated by Le Verrier. And on the first night of their search, they discovered the body we now know to be the planet Neptune. Meanwhile, in England, Airy had at last alerted James Challis at Cambridge, and Challis began to search, but not very energetically, and he was also preoccupied with observing comets, notably Beeler's comet that had broken in half. And although Challis did have a big telescope, the Northumberland refractor, and although we now know he did record the planet in the first day of his search, he had not compared his observations, and so the actual discovery was made by Gala and Darest on the basis of Le Verrier's work. And I may say, that work was amazingly accurate. Here is the position in which Le Verrier had predicted, and there is where Neptune actually turned up. And Adams almost as accurate. It was a real triumph of mathematical science. At the moment, Neptune, like Uranus, is in Sagittarius. But because it's much further away, it's fainter. You can't see it with the naked eye. The magnitude is 7.7. .7, so binoculars will show it as a star-like point. But to see a disk, you do need a telescope. And there's a sketch I made of Neptune some time ago. In size and mass, Neptune and Uranus are very similar, both about 30,000 miles across. Neptune is slightly smaller, slightly denser, and rather more massive. It takes nearly 165 years to go around the sun, and it's bluish rather than greenish. But again, for our first real information, we had to await the pass of Voyager 2 in 1989. And in fact, here's one of the early pictures showing the dynamic Neptune with that strange feature there, the storm known as the Great Dark Spot. And there's nothing like that on Uranus. And also there are other features there, another feature called the scooter, which go round the planet more quickly. And again, remember, Neptune has a short day less than 20 hours long. And there are clouds too, 
made up of methane cirrus. And there you can see them, the white clouds, casting shadows on the cloud deck below. And you don't see that on any other planet in the solar system. But once Voyager had gone by, telescopes on Earth won't show details on Neptune. But the Hubble Space Telescope, in its revised form, will. And here are three Hubble pictures. And you can't see the great dark spot. And you should be able to, if it still existed. And it may well be that the great dark spot has now disappeared, in which case Neptune is even more variable than expected. Certainly very different from the bland Uranus. But even the Hubble telescope won't show Neptune's thin, dark rings discovered by Voyager. This, of course, is a negative picture. But what about Neptune's satellites? Two were known pre-Voyager, Triton and Neliad. There's an early Voyager picture of Triton, which we thought wrongly to be larger than our moon. But Neliad is a puzzle. It's very small, and that's the only Voyager picture of it, because it was taken from long range, and we don't know very much about Neliad. But certainly, the sizes were a surprise. They are both smaller than we expected. There's the moon, compared with Triton, and Neliad, as you can see, is a real dwarf. But the strangest thing is the way in which they move. Triton goes around Neptune in an almost circular path, but goes around the wrong way, like a car going the wrong way around a roundabout. And that's the only case of our major satellite going around its primary in a direction opposite to that in which the primary spins. And Neliad has a strange eccentric path, much more like that of a comet than a satellite. Voyager also discovered several new satellites, very close into Neptune, and uh, one of these, we now call Proteus, is actually larger than Neliad, although from Earth you can't see it because it's too close to Neptune. But the real surprise was Triton, which turned out to be smaller and colder than expected, and to have its pole covered with pink snow. Not ordinary snow, but nitrogen snow. And that was the last thing we expected. You can see here our computer simulation voyage over the pole of Triton, and then away to the region nearer the satellite's equator, where there are frozen lakes. But no mountains, and very few craters. There's almost no surface relief on Triton. But the greatest surprise of all was that of the discovery of nitrogen geysers. And there's a Voyager picture, and over to the right-hand side, you can see those black streaks. Apparently, below the surface, there's a layer of liquid nitrogen. And if that migrates toward the surface for any reason, the pressure is relaxed, and it explodes in a shower of nitrogen vapor and ice, producing geysers, and the debris then blown downwind in the very thin Tritonian atmosphere. And certainly, that was the last thing we expected on a world so cold and so far away as Triton. And I always like this last picture, the last picture sent back by a Voyager of Neptune and Triton, both shown up there as crescents. It was a fitting way, and I think Larry Soderblom, one of the NASA scientists, said, wow, what a way to leave the solar system. But then, of course, there's one more planet not surveyed by Voyager. Neptune was discovered in 1846, and again, the solar system appeared to be complete. But was it? One man who didn't believe so was Percival Lowell. Around 1900, he made fresh calculations, decided that the outer planets weren't moving quite as they should, and there might be yet another unknown planet pulling them out of position. Using his observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona, equipped with a very fine refracting telescope that I know well, he began looking for it. He didn't find it. He thought he knew what it was, but it simply didn't show up. And Lowell died in 1916, the planet still unfound. For some years, nothing more was done. And then in 1929, astronomers at the Lowell Observatory went back to it. And it was in charge this time of a then young astronomer, Clyde Tombaugh. There's a picture I took of him some years ago who used a 13-inch telescope to look in the position indicated by Lowell and see whether he could, in fact, find another planet. And in 1930, he did. His method was to go around the sky, photographing the same areas uh, over a period of nights. Now, the stars will still remain in the same relative positions, but a moving body will appear to shift. And here are the discovery plates. You can see there Pluto in the middle, that blinking spot, and that shows a shift in position over a period of about 10 days. But it looks exactly like a star, and that was the only way in which it could be identified. But it turned out to be a puzzle straight away. It takes 248 years to go around the sun, but the orbit is peculiar. As you can see from this, the orbit is eccentric, and nearest to the sun comes actually inside the path of Neptune, although there's no fear of a collision on the line, because Pluto's path is also tilted at a sharp angle of 17 degrees, and it doesn't actually go anywhere near Neptune. But that appeared to be most unplanetary, and straight away cast doubt upon Pluto's true status.
Also, there was the question of size. Pluto turned out to be very small, smaller, in fact, than our moon, and even smaller than Triton. And Pluto's companion, Charon, discovered in 1977, is about half Pluto's size. And compared with Neptune, they're very small indeed. And the point about that, of course, is that a very lightweight, small body like Pluto could not possibly pull a planet such as Neptune measurably out of position. So it may well be that Lowell's prediction was sheer luck. We don't know. But certainly, Pluto and Charon can be seen separately with the Hubble Space Telescope, and they both appear to be ice-covered, methane ice or water ice. And Pluto does have a very thin atmosphere at the moment, but it may not keep it. Remember, Pluto's distance from the Sun varies very much. In 1979, it came inside that Neptune. It reached perihelion in 1989. And in 1999, it'll again go further out than Neptune and become the outermost member of the planetary system. But when Pluto is furthest away from the Sun, it is so far out and so cold that the atmosphere may well condense out onto the surface. And for long periods, in this 248-year revolution period, Pluto may be completely airless. So I wonder, is Pluto a proper planet? Frankly, I don't think it is. More likely, it and Charon are planetesimals, the building blocks left over when the main planets were formed, and Triton may come into the same category. And in that case, there may possibly be yet another planet beyond Pluto. We call it Planet X. It may or may not be there. If it is, it's going to be very hard to find. But I just wonder, on this journey out of the solar system, will Voyager 2 pass it? <laughs> I don't know. If it does, I'm afraid we'll never know. Meanwhile, these three outer worlds are there. Uranus, with its bland surface and its rings. Neptune, as seen there from the Iliad. And finally, Pluto, a strange little world which may not be a proper planet at all. And although these three worlds are so much less spectacular than Saturn, I think to a degree they do have a fascination all their own. Before I end, something quite different. In mid-November, round about the 17th, we may have a meteor storm as we go through the Leonid Shire. I'm not saying we will, I'm saying we may. And if so, we'd like you to help in observing it. Before we're ready to do this, will you send a large stamped address envelope to this address, Leonid Watch 95, PO Box 7, London W5 2GQ, marking it A if you are an experienced observer, and we'll send you an observing pack. I don't want to raise your hopes, nothing may happen, but quite possibly it will, and if so, we'd like to get all the information it can. Meanwhile, if you want the latest information, then you can dial up our Sky Night information line, 0891 or dial up CFAX, page 615. And when I come back next month, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Russell Cannon, and we're going to talk about recent developments at the Anglo-Australian Observatory in New South Wales. So until then, good night.